Hello, everyone. My name is Tyler, and today I'll be analyzing and reviewing Throne of Blood by Akira Kurosawa and comparing it to Macbeth by the bard himself, William Shakespeare. So for a little summary, the movie starts off with the man informing his leader that some of their towers have fallen to the enemy. The battle goes on, and the leader's two greatest warriors become victorious in battle. The leader and Joy calls these great warriors to his palace. On the way, the warriors get lost in the forest encountering a spirit with tales of prophecy and desire for the two, after which it then disappears. The two warriors are confused at first and then laugh it off. They report to their leaders and are awarded with new command posts. This sounds great until they see that what the spirit has been talking about in the forest had come true. As time goes on, one of the warriors, Mishizu, is driven mad by the encounter in the forest and the pressure from his wife, Asaji. Throughout the movie, she assures him that his interaction with the spirit was real and the prophecy is very much true. Well, Shizu eventually succumbs to the pressure and follows destiny by killing the king and feeling the guilt of doing so. After suffering loss and his mind being run by madness, he's driven bitter and irrational towards his end. Similarities between Throne of Blood and Macbeth are as follows. At the start of the movie, there's a battle and quotes on the screen read, so the mighty fortress and lived a proud warrior. And Macbeth, from what I remember, started with him and Benko winning a battle. A soldier at the beginning of this adaptation is reporting to the warlord the victories. After said battle, Macbeth and Benko encounter three witches who tell them tales of their fortune. In the force of this adaptation, the two mighty warriors, Mishizu and Miki, find a spirit which is similar to the witches Macbeth and Benko encounter. Like I mentioned before, the spirit spoke of prophecy and desire, like the witches did Macbeth. The spirit even told Miki that his son will come heir to the king's throne, like Benko was told. The two brave warriors then get rewarded with new positions of their successes in the battle. As Rashizu is promoted, the warlord comes to stay at his castle to discuss plans for, his next, for the next battle, like King Duncan did. And that night, the king is assassinated. This murder starts to steer both Rashizu and Macbeth to madness, as they become responsible for more and more deaths. One of them being their best friend, Banquo, and in this case, Miki. Well, Shizu starts to hallucinate and sees Miki's ghost at a dinner after his assassination, just as Macbeth, Macbeth saw Banquo's, excuse me. Many characters then visit the spirit again. The spirit informs Shizu that he will never lose as long as the force does not move. But Shizu, like Macbeth, took this message and ran as his trees, trees don't usually travel. This made both characters more violent and irrational. With this violence and emotional turmoil within the two, their wives act as fuel to the flame. I noticed that Washizu's wife, Asaji, acts as a bad influence, just like Lady Macbeth. She even encourages him to kill Miki because he may turn his back on, leaving him with the same fate as Banquo. Another similarity between the wives are the questioning of manlyhood. For example, while Asaji was trying to get Washizu to murder, the king, she says, without ambition, Man is not man. And while Lady Macbeth was trying to get Macbeth to murder the king, she says, when you durst do it, then you were a man. Asaji goes on to scold him for being afraid of the ghost that he saw when he was hallucinating. The wives are truly people you don't want to be around. And in both plays, they to come to the guilt of killing the king and are driven mad. Now, some differences between the adaptation and the original story well, the big difference is, of course, that Throne of Blood is set in feudal Japan, Japan and Macbeth was set in 11th century Scotland. One difference from the start is that Miki doesn't have multiple sons to be heir. He only has one. And Miki's son switches sides and fights with the army of the opposition after Miki's murdered. I feel like this puts the character in place of the second, the second Malcolm from Macbeth, while, which I'll explain on later. Another difference I noticed is the framing of the murder of the king and lordship. In this piece, only one guard was framed and it was a lot less elaborate than the smearing of blood and dagger decoys. This time, the sleeping guard had the murder weapon planted on him by Asaji for the whole command post to see. This event was meant to clear the air for Shizu so no one could suspect him of killing his lordship. On the topic of suspicion, one thing I noticed about this adaptation is the difference of the Macduff character. It's not really solid in this one. The Lordship's son, Kunumari, instantly suspects Mushizu of killing his father and switches sides to the enemy with another soldier, Noriyasu. 
This puts Kunumari in the place of Malcolm and Macduff, as he was the one who led to suspicion and order for Washizu's execution in the end. It would be difficult to say that Noriyasu could be the Macduff character because he was only following behind Kunumari and took no charge. Another difference I noticed was Washizu getting paranoid and having Niki's head brought to him instead of him just being stabbed to death, like Banku was. Banku was, my apologies. This is all because he thought that Miki would betray him, which really solidifies his place as a Banquo character. A small difference in this scene is that Washizu murders the man who killed Miki, likely out of guilt or anger. I'm not really sure why. This paranoia and instability was likely caused by, by the bewilderment from talking to the spirit in the forest and a strong influence from Masaji. It was really a man versus self-conflict while the story kept progressing. Speaking of Asaji, a small difference I noticed in the invisible blood scenes in the two adaptations are Asaji in the Throne of Blood couldn't get invisible blood off of her hands, while Lady Macbeth couldn't get the invisible blood out of her dress. Similarly, another difference is that instead of the main character's wife killing herself, in this case, it's Miki's wife who does, out of fear that the castle is going to be attacked. This change, in my opinion, added pressure to Washizu, as this can be seen as another consequence of his actions. How does Drone of Blood succeed or fail at adapting the fest to a new time, place, culture, etc.? I believe Akira Kurosawa did a beautiful job at adapting the story of Macbeth to this time period and culture. Nothing really fell out of place or anything, and the plot flowed smoothly. It was really interesting to see such a story like Macbeth morph like this. And I love when someone is able to take a familiar subject and put a twist on it. This is a great example of it. It's like innovation in a way. Does it adhere to neoclassical ideals of English Renaissance and such? I noticed that the scenes and backgrounds were either actually in the beauty of nature, so the perception of death wasn't an illusion, or there was great prop work that put the scenes in place. For example, Oshizu and Miki were talking to the spirit in the forest, and there was a lot of fog in a dark, ominous landscape that appeared to be an actual forest. Along with that, there were piles of skulls and remains, which I feel really put, which I feel really supported the scene. Hopefully those weren't real though. On the topic of that scene, people don't usually teleport in real life, or can we really relate to the spirit that we saw in any way? So that would be one rule that was violated. That being the vers the vers please, the verisimilitude or realism rule. Hopefully I said that right. And one thing done right was the adherence to the social classes or decorum. For example, the movie has many noble characters in it, as there are many warriors living by their leader's rule like how it was in the traditional Japanese feudal system or similar cultures like the Royal Army in Scotland. Overall rating, um, honestly, I enjoyed the movie, whether it was the acting, the music, or the cinematography. I was always entertained. I was, it was shot in black and white and even had the audio delay like the other adventures quality movies at the time. The use of practical effects was great for its time as well, which is like 1957. I really liked how you could always tell how the characters were feeling through their exaggerated emotions or their exaggerated emotions. The only thing I would critique would be the loud music in some scenes. Some of those could shatter glass along with my eardrums. But altogether, it was a great watch, and I'd give it 8 out of 10 Arizona cans. Thank you.